Um, we are now standing along the perimeter of, and we're facing into an alcove space. It's a rather intimate alcove space. It's roughly circular in shape. Ceilings are about 12 feet high. The diameter of the space is about 12 feet in diameter. So it is a kind of a small, cozy, intimate space. In the center of this space is situated a freestanding sculpture, which is going to be the focus of our observation and our discussion today. And just to orient you, this alcove space is sort of jutting off of to the side of the main ramp, which runs from the ground floor some six stories up to the top of the museum. So we're facing into the alcove, and the ramp is behind us. And beyond that, still behind us, is the large central rotunda space of the Guggenheim Museum. So towards your left, the museum continues to spiral up. And towards your right, the museum continues to spiral down. We're about halfway up. We are, in Guggenheim jargon, at the beginning of ramp four, OK? Uh, so um, the wall label, which is actually located on the wall to the far side of this sculpture, tells us that this is a work by the American artist John Chamberlain. Chamberlain was born in 1927 and unfortunately passed just this past December, the age of 84. The work is, was made in 1967. It's made out of galvanized steel, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. Um, and the title of the work is Ultima Thule. And I'm going to spell that, U-L-T-I-M-A-T-H-U-L-E. And I know the title may sound a little puzzling, and indeed it is. John Chamberlain is famous for choosing titles that really have absolutely no direct reference to the sculpture. So for now, we're going to put the title aside. We will come back to the title. So the sculpture is about six feet tall. It's about four feet across at its widest point, And it's sitting directly on the floor. Um, it's an abstract sculpture. Okay, so this is not a figure, it's a purely abstract sculpture. And just to specify, it was actually made by taking three rectangular shaped galvanized steel boxes that, that Chamberlain actually ordered from a factory. One of the tops of the boxes was open. He stuck them individually in a crusher. He crushed the boxes and then he stacked them or fitted them together vertically. Okay, so that's the basic sort of orientation that we have. The pieces are held together basically by the force of gravity. When you walk around the sculpture, you will see the occasional screw and the occasional hole, which at specific strategic points is actually keeping the metal together. But because the boxes are stacked, they're basically just sitting on top of each other. Okay? So galvanized steel. Like, I remember my mom's pails being made out of galvanized steel. It's a fairly industrial, fairly utilitarian material. Um, it's actually steel coated in iron, which keeps the metal from rusting. Um, the steel itself is a medium gray. It's kind of the color of a medium gray day, and the sky and the clouds. I call it battleship gray. It looks like a battleship to me. Um, the iron appears on the surface as this dense spattering of lighter gray marks. So it's really as if somebody took a paintbrush, a paintbrush that's about an inch across at the tip, stuck it in light gray paint, and sort of vigorously dabbed the light gray paint over the entire surface of the steel. So there's a very, very lively visual texture to this. But if we touched the metal itself, it would be absolutely smooth. Okay, so the form, the form is, is, again, in its essential form, it's really like a backwards capital letter C. There's a gentle curve in a form that is otherwise just vertically oriented. Um, I had a visitor with low vision looking at this work with me, and she said that the sculpture looked like a lobster tail. And I was just like, of course. Why? She was remarking on the fact that there's a joint-like form that articulates this sculpture from the bottom to the top. And the joints are created actually by the edges of the boxes themselves. 
and by the, by the edges of the open ends of the box. It just happened to fall, from where we're looking at the sculpture, at these very, very gentle diagonals from top to bottom. So I thought that was a beautiful, beautiful analogy. Um, it reminds me of one of those um, kind of curved um, smokestacks that you see on the deck of a ship. It also reminds me of a French horn. It's been kind of stretched vertically, and the horn part itself kind of curves over like a beautiful flower. Um, a critic once said that they thought this sculpture looked like a dancer. And again, he was remarking, I think, on this sort of beautiful, gentle curve in the center of the sculpture. And I would love to invite everybody to bend sideways at their waist. Something as simple as that, I think beautifully articulates the essential form of this sculpture. And I also think it's nice because it reminds us that our body has joints that allow us to move. And I'm, you know, I'm reminded of the lobster tail because I thought that was such a beautiful sort of visual metaphor. You know, but this is not made out of soft, supple, lithe bodies, right? This is made out of hard metal that's been crushed and stacked, you know, with all of the kind of oddly protruding forms, all of the dents, all of the creases, all of the dings and all of the bends and all of the crushed areas that you might imagine if you stuck a metal box into a crusher. So there's one other thing I would love to suggest, which is why I'm holding these cigarette boxes, which might completely freak everybody out, including me. Um, John Chamberlain used to sit at a bar drinking with his friends. And he would sit and he would crush cigarette boxes. And you know, it wasn't just an idle thing. He was actually fascinated by the force of the hand crushing the box. How does the hand close? How does it crush? And how does the box respond? I tried to get 50 of these. And I don't know, five years ago it would have been easy. Right now it's really hard. I'm just going to pass these out to an assorted few people who would like to crush a box and maybe they can talk about it afterwards or just imagine that crushing form. And actually another way to imagine it, and this John Chamberlain also did this, is remember when we used to blow up paper bags when we were young and pop them? So Chamberlain loved that memory. So he would blow up the paper bags and he would very slowly crush them. And again, he was just fascinated by this very simple act with the tension and the response of the material. Um, I also have a way that I would like to explore this through sound, but maybe we can do that in a moment because I feel like I've been talking a lot. And I would like to ask you, A, how more, or how differently can I describe this so that you have an absolutely full picture in your head as to what you're looking at? Or would anybody like to share how they might describe this work that they're looking at through whatever visual capabilities they have or just through the description that I've already iterated here? How would you describe this? What's your name? Susan. Susan, please. I'm struck by your describing the general curve of the, of the sculpture, but when you I'm also struck by the fact that that curve is created by us. But if you actually look at the sculpture, there's nothing but sharp angles. Right. There are no smooth curves right. really anywhere. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. There are sharp angles and creases and places the creases are so tight that the metal is cracked. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, the way the, the boxes are aligned on top of one another and the bends and the shapes, it does sort of create sense of a curve, right. the curve isn't really there. Right. So I have a question for you then. This is really interesting to me. I mean, I chose the basic form so that it's the first layer of imaging in somebody's head and then got to the, but this is crushed metal. It's got dings and it's got bends and it's got, hoping that that would automatically transform a C into something that's made out of all these kind of jagged parts. Did that make sense as a listener? It's hard for me to say whether as a listener as a, or as Okay, or as somebody. Well, actually, maybe, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Vivian, you can give us a hand. Yeah, I, mean, I can see the form, mm -hmm. although it's it's not as sharp right. as everyone else. So, therefore, what I get out of it is that 
even though it's metal and the power of it, you described really well, that it's sitting on, that it's, it's sitting, its own weight is holding it down. Mm -hmm. For me, there's such a softness and fluidity to it. You mentioned a dancer. For me, there, you know, it just begs me to go over and feel it. Yes. And, you know, I love all the work I saw. I just, but it, there's something just so gentle. I yes. know, it's a real... Um, uh, what's the word? Um, it's like there's a there's a connection kind of, yeah. between what it is and the way this makes me feel, which is really great. And okay, just so just to repeat that, Vivian is talking about something that actually is loaded in all of the liter about, ch literature about Chamberlain. Oh, really? So this would be a beautiful moment to start talking about the work. That, you know, it's this hard, jaggedy metal, and yet there's such a fluidity about the whole thing. You know, it's the pieces are sitting on top of each other and yet there's kind of a counter energy, which is why I think the critics said it reminds him of a dancer. I mean, he actually used the word flawless in its form. One of the most interesting, and actually the curator writes about this in the catalog. She's fascinated by the fact that these sculptures, and you know, in a discussion with a group, we'd start talking about the other sculptures that are around us. These sculptures are both hard and soft. They're both static and moving or flowing or organic. There's all of these contradictory forces that are somehow beautifully integrated into these particular forms. And that's a beautiful, I've already had a group come in for the John Chamberlain. That was one of the most interesting forms of discussion because it also allowed varying views on how people are reading either the form or the material as soft or hard to come into play. And we could say, well, Chamberlain was kind of working between those things. And it was just a beautiful way to be able to use everybody's input. Yeah, yeah nice. Yeah, please. Uh, if a robot had a spine uh, vertebrae, that's Lovely. Like, this is kind of Lovely. Right OK, OK. And that would be a beautiful description. It would be an abs. I'm not as young as you, so I'm not so robot or I'm thinking more of crustaceans. It's like my dad's a biologist, so you know, I loved her. Lot, but, but I mean, this is a beautiful example. There's a lot of fantastic ways to describe this. And you know, I, I kind of struggled with a few before I talked about this group with, uh, this sculpture with a group of people with low vision and blindness. And what I did more, I mean, I did it right away. I kind of gave you guys the sort of art beyond sight version of description, but I wanted them to tell me what this shape was because if somebody was sighted, I just kind of didn't get the, and that's when somebody said, you know, lobster tail, and all these other beautiful things came out. I was just like, thank you. Now I use those to describe with people who are sighted, and I use it all the time. So I'll never throw a piece, take a piece of paper and crumple it and throw it in the garbage. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look at it totally differently. Oh, so this is like, beautiful. Yeah, okay. Vivian just said that from here on out, when she crumples up a piece of paper and throws it in the garbage, she's going to think about it differently. And you know, Vivian, there are sculptures in this exhibition that are made out of paper bags. They're in the vitrines because they're very delicate. They've been covered in resin and paint, but they're paper bags, you know, and they're absolutely lovely. Yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. I don't know if anyone said this because I can be here, but I really like the cigarette box analogy. And I would say that uh, a so empty silver can would work. Beautiful. Yeah, Beautiful. That's beautiful. No. So she suggested that the cigarette pox is a good idea, but an empty soda can would also work equally well. And I told, I mean, I totally agree. You know, we brought out the paper bags and we brought, I was trying to stick with the materials that Chamberlain famously worked with. But I mean, this is an interpretive strategy of that that would still allow for people to experience that. You know, one of the things I think is interesting about your comment is that Chamberlain was kind of interested in how when you crush a cigarette box and then you let go, it kind of bounces back. And that happens with tin cans, too, because I do crush them and I get furious when they bounce back, right? So there's that beautiful tension in the... That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, please. I'm wondering, um, I'm looking at it from a different angle. Yes, yes. And I'm wondering if you talked about the C shape, which I, I don't... Yes, this is a great so question. When you talk about sculpture to how many dimensions do you talk about? That's it? a great what's your name? Rosalind. Rosalind. So Rosalind just said, I mean from where Rosalind's sitting, 
right? She doesn't really see the she the C shape is clearly, and this is a freestanding sculpture and we are supposed to walk around it, so how do you handle that? I mean, we never have groups of 50, for one thing. Um, we have 20 max, and because I like to ground the description in a common experience, we'll all sit here, but then I do have this beautiful sound piece that I would love to work with you, I just don't know if we have time. I would start walking them around through the sound echo component, and as we're walking around, I'll just tell you what I was gonna do. I mean, I found that this, this, this piece has an amazing soundscape, and I used it with my group. When we walked around and I asked people to just throw their voices at the sculpture, and because this material has such an incredible echo property, and because all the forms are kind of everywhere, it picks up your voice in very different ways as you, and I did this with a group of people with low vision and when she got back she said, I have now heard what the form is. Because it varies, it changes, it's like this beautiful symphony. So it was just a really nice sound, sort of uh, parallel to the kind of abstract forms. So we, you know, we definitely walk around it. It's absolutely essential. And I mean, ordinarily I would say take a walk around and then sit. Right, like with a painting, I'd always say, get nice and close, take a good close look before we start. So yeah, no, but that's a great point. Yeah, yeah, Missy. Um, and again, I don't know if it's because of where I'm sitting, mm -hmm. but the, I think another aspect of this is the effect of the light on it. Totally. And so that there's some confusion, visual confusion. You see, you see a whole range of grains. Yep. So that shadow becomes an element as well as you know, seeing into the depth Absolutely. So Missy just said she's talking about the light and the shadow and the range of grays that show up on the surface depending on where you're standing and that that would be an important element to sort of get to a more detailed description maybe of the different shades of gray, which I actually think is a great idea. As far as the shadows go, one part of the sound piece, when I introduce the sound component of the interaction, I say that John Chamberlain wished for us to not only, I feel so badly that I have my backs to you, I kind of can't stand it. Um, John Chamberlain, you know, he, he wanted us to walk, these are very, in the round, there's no front to this sculpture, right? He wanted us to not only look at the surface, but also to look inside the sculpture. And as a matter of fact, he once said the best way to see this work is to clean it. Because you have to take your little, your little dust thing or your little rag and you have to stick your hands inside of it and wipe all of the surfaces. So when I have them walk around and I ask them to, to turn their faces toward the sculpture, I say the darker areas that you might be seeing are those pockets of space. And you can look into them and they're kind of like these dark abysses. If that's not working, feel free to throw your voice at it because it really does work the same way. But I agree with your, there are different shades of gray here and I think that's something that I would have to fix. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, one of the questions that I have is that you said that the piece was sitting on the ground mm -hmm. and from where I'm standing, it looks like it's balanced it doesn't look like it's really sitting on the ground. Okay, nice. It looks like it's nice. balanced on some kind of a point and could fall over. Mm -hmm. No? No, abs, what's your name? Beverly. So Beverly just said, when I said it's sitting on the ground, she's like, well, from where I am, it's not sitting on the ground. And it's true. I, I hadn't even really thought about this. This would be something absolutely to refine. And I don't see it as much here as I do in a lot of the other sculptures where there's just a few points sitting on the ground. And otherwise, it's just, it, it seems like it's precariously perched there. Of course, it's not. It's totally stable. But I think, back to the question of the lightness that Vivian was talking about, to not say it's just placed on the ground, but to talk about the fact that there are points on the ground and other points are actually elevating above the ground would give it that kind of sense of buoyancy in a more, uh, in a more kind of clear fashion. Absolutely. I would totally agree with you, yeah. And you know, somebody from the group might, like, like in this interaction, might say that, and I would say, oh my God, you know, next time I describe this, I'm certainly gonna remark on that, because, um, because it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true, yeah, yeah.